The following presentation is brought to you by Discovery Education, leading the world of digital and video learning. Discovery Education, connect to a world of learning. Our nation's use of the atomic bomb remains one of the most controversial and emotional issues of World War II. Americans born before 1940 in general cannot comprehend how anyone could be critical of President Truman's decision to end the war. Those born after 1945, growing up in the Cold War, wonder if there was not a better alternative. By 1936, it became increasingly clear to the world that Germany, Italy, and Japan were pursuing a common path of aggression, both in Europe and the Far East. The signing of the Tri-Party Pact, September 27, 1940, agreeing not to invade each other's country, would have far-reaching effects. The development of America's atomic bomb begins in 1939. An immigrant Hungarian physicist named Leo Szilard learns that German scientists have discovered how to split the atom. Splitting the uranium atom might create a chain reaction, releasing a million times more energy than an equal amount of high explosives. Zillard is Jewish. He flees Germany following Hitler's rise to chancellor. Intelligence reports begin to trickle in showing that the Germans are making progress on atomic weapons research. Zillard persuades his friend Albert Einstein to co-sign a letter to President Roosevelt imploring him to begin atomic weapons research in earnest. To this point, government nuclear research has received the grand sum of $2,000. The president orders an all-out effort to create the A-bomb. The daunting task is assigned to the Army Corps of Engineers, Manhattan District in New York City, giving the new Manhattan Project its name. They assign one of its most can-do officers to direct the program, General Leslie Richard Groves. Groves appoints Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, a brilliant physicist teaching at the University of California at Berkeley. Due to the uncertainty of which element would make a better bomb, two enormous facilities are built practically overnight, a plutonium plant in Hanford, Washington, and a uranium-235 plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. A plant called Los Alamos in New Mexico is the site for the A-bomb's design and assembly. Busy factory workers are oblivious to their assignments. Tons of materials arrive, but mysteriously, nothing is produced. Scientists must refer to each other in cryptic code names. The A-bomb is never referred to as a bomb. It's a gadget, or the gimmick. And despite the enormous precautions in place, the Soviets have infiltrated this top-secret project. Their spy at Los Alamos is Dr. Klaus Fuchs. But one problem looms. At the moment, no airplane in the Allied inventory is capable of delivering such a weapon to the Japanese mainland. By early 1944, the Boeing Airplane Company gears up to produce a revolutionary new aircraft, the B-29. Officially named the Super Fortress, the plane is a gigantic leap forward, 25% faster than its predecessor, the B-17. It can carry a 20,000-pound bomb load and fly more than 4,000 miles. It will become central to the Allies' plan for the defeat of Japan and America's ability to deliver the bomb. The first objective is to provide an air base close enough to Japan's industrial centers so the B-29s can attack. The Marianas Islands, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam are the next targets for the U.S. Marines. As mop-up operations in the Marianas begin, 
a highly qualified colonel named Paul Tibbetts is scouring U.S. air bases, handpicking his crew for the top secret mission. His outfit, the 509th, will train at Windover Field in Utah until the new B-29 airfields are built. Test drops at Windover are intended to help the Alamogordo lab refine the casing designs for the two different bombs that they're developing. And now, bomb away. The uranium-235 being extracted from Oak Ridge is a long, thin bomb nicknamed Thin Man. Greater advances in the bomb's physics allow scientists to shorten Thin Man from 17 to 9 feet and to change its name to Little Boy. The scientists in New Mexico begin experimenting with the plutonium bomb, nicknamed Fat Man. This implosion bomb is more efficient and can be manufactured quickly because of its abundance. General Groves sends Commander Frederick L. Ashworth to the Marianas to find a new home for the 509th. Because the island is flat, Tinian is selected. The only Japanese base capable of interfering with American bombing operations is Iwo Jima, 775 miles from Japan. Once the island is taken, it will be used as a fighter base for escorting bombers and an emergency landing site for the crippled B-29s returning from bombing raids on Tokyo. April 12, 1945. Word comes from Warm Springs, Georgia, that President Roosevelt suddenly dies from a brain hemorrhage. The nation mourns its beloved leader. Harry Truman has been vice president for 82 days. In that time, he met with FDR twice. He has no knowledge of the atomic bomb. Two outspoken cabinet members with knowledge of the bomb have conflicting opinions. Henry L. Stimson, Secretary of War, fears negative public opinion and dire irreversible consequences, suggests staging a demonstration. Within four months, we shall in all probability have completed the most terrible weapon ever known in human history. One bomb of which can destroy a whole city. The world, in its present state of moral advance, would eventually be at the mercy of such a weapon. In other words, modern civilization might be completely destroyed. Politically savvy, Secretary of State James F. Burns is pro-bomb. He believes a demonstration would considerably weaken our hand. He fears the Soviet Union's emergence, while keeping one eye on the upcoming general elections. A test shot is arranged on the grounds of the Alamogordo test site, 120 miles south of Los Alamos. The place is called Journey of Death. Its code name is Trinity. It's a dry run to test and calibrate instruments with radioactive slugs spiked in amongst 100 tons of high explosives. This is the largest chemical explosion ever deliberately detonated. The test is a success and vital information is gathered. As final assembly of the A-bomb takes place, a glitch develops when the last segment sticks while being slid into place. Oppenheimer and the other scientists collectively hold their breath until they realize the segment is warmer than the rest of the sphere. When the temperature is equalized, the piece slides in. But as the sphere is hoisted to the top of the tower, a much more serious problem looms on the horizon. The evening before the test, a violent thunderstorm builds and breaks over ground zero. Will a stray bolt of lightning set off the gadget? No one knows. Postponement is a poor option. President Truman waits uneasily at the Potsdam Conference, hoping for positive results that he can use as leverage against Stalin, whom he fears will devour the Pacific region as he had in Eastern Europe. Scientists led by Zillard begin to struggle with the consequences of delivering such a weapon. 
a petition circulates to halt its completion. It's delivered to Burns, who supposedly gives it to President Truman. However, there has never been any record of this event. Finally, the rains stop. The skies clear and General Groves gives the go-ahead for the countdown. By cable, Truman receives good news from Groves. The president tells Stalin about a new weapon of unusual destructive force. But the Soviet premier is unmoved. Unbeknownst to Truman and Churchill, Soviet spy Klaus Fuchs has been keeping Stalin informed. Truman's deployment of the atomic bomb is swift. His note, dated July 26th, is the only handwritten authorization ever given for the use of atomic weapons. Suggestions approved. Release when ready, but not sooner than August 2nd. A cautionary Truman gives the Japanese time to respond to the terms of unconditional surrender. The bomb, still shrouded in secrecy, is never mentioned. July 26, 1945. President Truman officially declares the Potsdam Declaration. Call upon the government of Japan to proclaim now the unconditional surrender of all Japanese armed forces and to provide a proper and adequate assurances of their good faith in such action. The alternative for Japan is prompt and utter destruction. The Japanese cabinet decides to treat the Potsdam ultimatum with silent contempt, or mokosatu. Truman and his advisors have no choice but to proceed with the atomic bombing of Japan. Their final orders target four Japanese cities, Hiroshima, Kokora, Niigata, and Nagasaki. On the same day the Allies issue the Potsdam Declaration, the United States heavy cruiser Indianapolis drops anchor at Tinian Island. It is carrying a 300-pound lead bucket welded to its deck. Unbeknownst to the captain and the crew, the bucket contains the uranium-235 core for the little boy bomb. The precious cargo is unloaded and the ship departs. Four days later, a Japanese sub-torpedo sinks the Indianapolis. Three quarters of the crew die in the disaster, hundreds eaten by sharks. After years of planning, research, and anticipation, and after an expenditure of $2 billion, the day arrives. Little Boy is carefully towed out of the air-conditioned assembly hut with most of the island brass in attendance. The bomb is loaded onto its trailer and towed to a special loading pit equipped with a hydraulic lift. As the bomb rises into the hold of the Enola Gay, Captain William S. Parsons, the scientific engineer assigned to arming the bomb, confides his fear to General Grove's assistant, Brigadier Thomas Farrell, about a possible nuclear explosion on takeoff. Groves has already scotched Parsons' proposal to arm the bomb after takeoff as being too complex. But a series of recent crashes on Tinian has strengthened Parsons' hand. Farrell reconsiders and gives the go-ahead to arm the bomb in flight. The flight crew line up in front of the Enola Gay, named after Colonel Tibbet's mother. Navigator, Theodore Van Kirk. Bombardier, Thomas Ferriby, Tibbetts co-pilot Bob Lewis, and radar officer Jacob Beeser. With a final wave, Tibbetts bids farewell. At 2.45 a.m. Tinian time, Enola Gay trundles down the runway with the bomb and extra fuel. She is eight tons over normal gross takeoff weight. To the alarm of co-pilot Lewis, Tibbetts burns the entire two-mile runway to build up speed. At the last moment, Tibbetts eases back on the stick. With two B-29 escorts, Enola Gay edges skyward to a dying but defiant Japanese empire. At precisely 
8.16 a.m., the bomb bay doors open, and little boy plummets out of the Enola Gay. As soon as President Truman learns that the first atomic bomb has dropped on Hiroshima, he issues a public statement to the American people justifying the event. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. Following Truman's ominous warning, American planes drop leaflets over the Japanese islands, urging them to surrender. Even the Hiroshima bomb did not force Japan's capitulation, whose military code requires death in preference to surrender. But it does accelerate events in Moscow. Stalin now fulfills his promise to the Allies to invade Japan upon Germany's imminent defeat. Japan's ambassador to the Soviet Union still hopes for a mediated peace. Instead, there is a declaration of war. Minutes after midnight, Soviet troops storm across the Manchurian border and begin to overwhelm Japanese forces. It is one of the shortest campaigns of any modern war. A B-29 named Boxcar carrying the Fat Man bomb or plutonium bomb, like the one tested at Alamogordo, is in its final preparation on Tinian. Its casing gets a layer of personal graffiti. One of the messages scrawled in crayon salutes the lost crew of the USS Indianapolis. The men of the 509th are justly proud that the flight of the Enola Gay went precisely as planned, that the second atomic flight will suffer every bit of bad luck that the Enola Gay managed to avoid. President Truman issues his second authorization. The bomb is ready, weather permitting. Under strict orders to bomb only if they can see the actual target, Boxcar reaches Kokora and Niigata. Both destinations are under heavy ground haze. They are spared. Nagasaki will not be as fortunate. The air raid sirens in Nagasaki are silent. The workers return to the production lines. Courageously, the people try to resume some kind of routine under the heavy weight of impending doom. The Army Ministry of War is unable to recommend a unilateral surrender to the Emperor. The Soviet Union has declared war on Japan. The Allies' promise of a reign of ruin is imminent. The bomb cannot be halted. For 45 seconds, the second atomic bomb falls to Earth. Even though the drop is a tactical success for the crew, the celebration is delayed due to a frightening near mid-air collision 
the two planes, Boxcar and Great Artiste, suffer a harrowing near miss of the burgeoning mushroom cloud before heading for the closest island, Okinawa, a two-hour trip with a dwindling supply of fuel. Boxcar and the Great Artiste finally reach Okinawa, but the jinx still holds. Boxcar's pilot, Captain Charles Sweeney, transmits a mayday, but it mysteriously fails to reach the radio tower. Calling on all his skill, Sweeney unexpectedly touches down and barrels through a traffic pattern at 150 miles an hour, barely avoiding two parked B-24s. August 9th, the day of both the Soviet invasion and the Nagasaki bomb, was almost the final day of World War II. If needed, a third atomic bomb destined for Tokyo was ready at Los Alamos. Japan's decision to surrender is still bound in the rigid rules of imperial etiquette, but stronger voices prevail, and for the first time, the emperor has to exalt his supreme authority in imperial conference. The diminutive emperor Hirohito, who keeps a portrait of Abraham Lincoln in his study, issues his first voice communication, a radio address to the Japanese people. Hirohito, realizing there is no hope for his country's survival, supports the foreign ministry's plan that calls for one condition of surrender, to keep the emperor in power. Hirohito relents. I cannot bear to see my innocent people suffer any longer. On board the battleship USS Missouri, Anchored in Tokyo Harbor, General Douglas MacArthur accepts the Japanese surrender. World War II is over. General Groves addresses the nation regarding the decision to drop the bomb. Casualties, which would have resulted from an invasion in the Japanese home island, would have been tremendous. Churchill placed them at over a million Americans. The atomic bomb made it impossible for the Japanese to continue the war, despite their determination to fight to the bitter end. And in that fighting, they would have taken with them tens of thousands of Americans. Admiral Blady, in charge of atomic testing, makes important recommendations regarding the atomic bomb. It is essential that no country gain ascendancy over the United States in the development, manufacture, and tactical use of atomic weapons. It is impossible to convey the full meaning of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The casualty toll is staggering and fails to portray the indescribable suffering. Whether the bombings constituted a tragedy that could have been avoided by other measures, or a necessary military decision will always be debated. The United States and the Soviet Union emerge as the world's greatest powers. The Cold War begins. The day after Hiroshima, Stalin gathers his leading physicists and orders them to catch up with American atomic achievements. The Soviets launched their first atomic bomb. From 1945 to 1962, the United States conducts over 300 atmospheric nuclear tests. July 25, 1963, the U.S. and the Soviet Union signed the first treaty to limit nuclear testing. But Pandora's terrible box is already opened. One year later, China enters the nuclear race. Today, the threat of nuclear war is ever present. Many nations, including third world countries, are experimenting with nuclear bombs and other methods of mass destruction. The world has many challenges, 
and none greater than finding a way to bring the message of peace and freedom.